Well, good evening. And um, one of the things that even as Aaron was praying that the Lord began to place upon my heart was that in all this darkness, in all what's happening around us, the uncertainty, lots of people are asking me, are we going to go? Do you think we are going to go into another lockdown? Do you think things are going to be the way they were over the last uh, couple of months? <clears throat> well, we don't know exactly. But one thing we do know, and we need to hold on to the things that are certain. We need to hold on to the things that are sure. And the one thing that we do know is that God is good. So what I want to do is I want to sing that chorus again uh, until it settles in our hearts. The, the truth, uh, the reality of that. God is good. No matter how dark it is, God is good. No matter how difficult it is, God is good. You know, David said it like this, I almost slept, my feet would have slipped if I didn't hold on to the truth that God is good and the goodness, I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Therefore, let us just uh, sing that chorus again uh, and let that truth settle in our hearts. Let that be the guiding principle, one of the key principles of Christianity, a foundational principle of our faith, and that what supports and holds our faith is this, God is good all the time. God is good all the time. And therefore, we are going to sing that. Okay, so I'm going to ask Suren to lead us again. Okay, as we... Um, sing that chorus and uh, I would want you you're sitting in your homes right now or wherever you are um, well of course if you're driving you should not uh, just close your eyes right now okay and I want you to um, sing this from your heart and let this truth begin to settle in your heart Let us pray. Father, we just come before the throne of grace, Lord, and we pray. And let that peace settle in our hearts, Lord. Let the peace of God settle in our hearts. Let the truth of the goodness of God settle in our hearts. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, that you are a good, good Father. And Lord, no matter how bad things may be around us, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. To me, that is personal. And Lord, we thank you that you're a personal God. 
you care about us and you care about our situations and you care about our lives. You say you number the hairs on our head. Lord, you care so deeply for us, Lord. And at this time, Lord, let the confidence rise in our hearts, O God, to know that we are under the care of, of a good, good Father. Lord, I pray that even as we listen to your word today, that your word will con continue to encourage us and, and, and stir us up to good works and to good things, Lord, in our lives, Father. Let our lives be a manifestation of the goodness of God. Let our lives display to the world around us that there is a good, good Father up in heaven who is in control of all situations, no matter how bad they look on the surface. Lord, you are completely in control and you are working out your plans and purposes through this all. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, now as we listen to the word, Lord, let the word penetrate deep into our hearts and bring about change, bring about encouragement. Lord, bring about, Lord, your purposes in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today I want to speak to you about living a life without regret. You know, I wonder how many of you have seen the movie uh, Brave Heart. It's one of my favorite. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I will not be able to see it. But I'm sure some of you out there are wanting to lift up your hand and say, yeah, I like that movie. I know so many people like that movie. It's a Mel Gibson movie. He comes, he acts as William, the Scot Scottish legend, William Wallace. Uh, it came out, I believe, in 1995. Okay, it was a brilliant movie. Uh, it's about how William Wallace opposed the rule of King Edward the I, I think he was called Longshanks. And um, his girlfriend or fiance was murdered, and, and that kind of pushed William Wallace to taking up arms against uh, the, British, the British rule over Scotland. And we, there's a scene at the end of the movie where um, William Wallace is betrayed and then he's uh, captured and he's in, in, uh, in London in prison on trial, just about to be executed. And uh, Queen Isabella uh, comes to him in the dungeon and speaks to him and pleads with him to uh, beg for mercy, to repent of his sins so that the punishment would be less <clears throat> and um, maybe he will... Um, or the torture would be less and he wouldn't have to go through all the pain and suffering uh, before he dies. And maybe he even has a chance of uh, saving his life. And that's kind of the plot of the movie. That's kind of just setting up the scene for you. And right there is William Wallace who's, who's, who refuses to repent or recant what he has done. And, uh, but he says something, and that's what I want you to, to, um, to get. He says, every man dies, <clears throat> but not every man really lives. Every man dies, but not every man really lives. Over 7 billion people who are living in this world right now, and the question is, how many of them are really living the life that God put them on this earth to live? Let me ask you that question as you're watching this. Are you living the life that God has put you on this world to live? Are you living a life uh, with the assurance that at the end of it all, when you stand before the, the, the Father, when you stand before Jesus Christ, you will hear the words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Uh, that basically puts us in a place where we need to ask ourselves, at that point, are we going to hear those words and say, Yes, I have no regrets because I have lived in such a way. Or are we going to stand there and regret a lot of things that we have done in life? And therefore, I want to speak to you. How do you live a life with no regrets? Life is extremely uncertain right now. It has been forever and it's just becoming more and more uncertain. And the question is, how do I live a life without regrets? Where I will end life with no regrets. Once again... Sadly, many people are living uh, a, with a, a life that when they finish life, they, are, they, they come to a place where there's a whole lot of regret. Um, too many end their life realizing there's a, so much I could have done and I didn't do. So much I could have said and I didn't say. And I really have not lived the life 
that God has put me to, in this world to live. The Apostle Paul could have been such a person. He could have been a person who lived in a way that when he ended his life, he would have had a lot of regret. He could have been that person. And why do I say that? Because at one time in his life, he lived with a lot of zeal, a lot of passion. But his passion and zeal were leading him in a very destructive path. It was leading him uh, away from God. In fact, his passion and zeal, he believed strongly in his heart. He believed with such assurance that he was serving God, but he was not. In fact, he was going against the purposes of God. Uh, he was trying, he thought he was living the truth, but what he was really doing was he was muzzling the truth. He thought that he was living, you know, fighting for the purposes of God, but what he was actually doing, he was fighting against the purposes of God. He was put into prison and he was actually uh, uh, executing those who were the servants of God. So he was going completely in the opposite direction. But in his heart, he believed strongly he was doing what was right. Now, I want you to just imagine, what if Paul died on the road to Damascus? What if he didn't make it to, uh, to Damascus? Or what if he didn't make it to the point where Jesus appeared to him? What if he died on the road to Damascus? And what if he had to appear before the judgment seat of God. Could you imagine him waking up, thinking, I have done everything to serve God. I have served him with passion and zeal. I have done everything to oppose those who come against the purposes of God. And then think of him opening his eyes with such confidence and realizing everything he did in life was wrong. Can you imagine when he would have realized that his whole life was in vain? All he did, all he channeled his efforts and focus to were useless. How much regret do you think he would have had? You know, when Jesus confronted Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, verse 3 to 5, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you have persecuted. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Saul began to realize, thank God he didn't die on the road to Damascus. But he had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Jesus opened his eyes to the true situation of his life. And he began to realize that he was not serving God. He was opposing God. He began to realize he was not living the truth. He was living against the truth. Or he was fighting against the truth. And he began to realize that all he was doing was in vain. And you know what Paul did? He turned. And when he realized this, he put all that zeal and effort he put into living a life in vain, into serving God and doing what was right. And therefore, at the end of his life, at the actual end of his life, he was able to say, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. I have finished. And now I'm waiting to hear from the Lord, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. Is what he was waiting to hear because he understood he had actually lived that life. The reality is, friends, that there are so many of us who are living the life that Paul lived. We are channeling our efforts, our passions, our strengths, our resources, everything we have into things that are in vain. Things that in the end of the day we are going to regret and think to ourselves, why in the world did I waste my time on such things when I could have been living the way that God has called me to live? There are many people today who are chasing after a dream. You know, last, you know, they're chasing after this dream. And the sad reality is 
that many of them will chase their entire life after the dream and never catch that dream, but all their efforts and, and, and passions are put after chasing after a dream that is not a God-given dream, but a dream that they think that if I have this thing, my life would be perfect, my life would, I'll be so satisfied in life. And really, they're going to find out that they chase their whole life after the dream, never catch the dream, end up their life in absolute regret, and uh, sad. How many people have chased after financial security, and they have lived their life accumulating wealth, and at the end of their life, they realize all the money in the world could not buy them happiness, could not buy them the satisfaction they were looking for. But what is sadder, friends, is that there are many who will catch the dream, who will actually fulfill that dream. And they will think they're living the dream. When in reality, they're living a life in vain, an empty life. Once again, can you imagine Paul living a life of absolute zeal and passion? And one day in his life realizing that it was all in vain. It was destructive. It was in vain. But yet, when he was shown the truth, what did he do? He received the truth. He received the grace of God. He received the forgiveness of God. And he turned his life around and channeled his passions, his zeal, into chasing after the things of God and doing the things of God. And that's the problem with a lot of people today who even if they're shown the truth, and how useless and worthless it is to run after material and worldly possessions and worldly titles and worldly things, yet they refuse to turn, they refuse to change, they continue down the path of destruction. You know, I always tell you this, Frank Sinatra's uh, philosophy was, I did it my way, and there are many people today who are living their life with such bravado, sing, thinking, I'm doing it my way. Let me tell you, those are people who are going to wake up one day on the other side of, of uh, eternity and realize that all that was in vain and they'll real, wake up with a lot of regret. You know, in his song, I Did It My Way, Frank Sinatra says, and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. He's talking about when death has come, and you know, the end is near, and he says this. He says, and, and more, and much more than this, I did it my way. And listen to what he says. Regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. In other words, you know what? I had no regrets in life. True. But what happens when he wakes up on the other side? You think he'll have regrets? Well, if he lived with this philosophy that he's singing, he'll definitely get up with a lot of regrets. Because there's only one way to do it, friends. There's only one way to live our lives and end up with no regrets. And that one way is to do it God's way. So let's talk about what it means to live a life with no regrets. Number one, the first thing we need to do is live right. Okay, now that sounds a bit simple and that sounds a bit redundant. Of course, you've got to live right. But let me explain what that means. Okay, so to live right, remember Nike had a, a Nike put out this uh, a wristband, live strong. Okay, somehow that was discontinued uh, because they found out the person that they went after was, was taking all kinds of substances, so that, that, that lost its uh, effect and they realized that that's not the right way to live. So what is the right way to live? Live right. How do you live right? We're going to look at this through the life of the Apostle Paul. Acts 20 verse 17, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia. Paul says to the elders of the church in Ephesus, the way he lived was his credentials. He said, listen, you want to know who I am, then just you consider my life, the way I lived among you. Paul obviously lived right for him to say such, such a thing with such confidence. So what does it mean to live right? 
In the Old Testament, God speaks to Habakkuk and, and, and talks to him about what it means. And he says in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, he says, See, he is puffed up, his desires are not upright. He talks about the pride man who's not living right. And then he says, But the righteous will live by his faith. Righteousness means to be and do what is right. And to be and do what is right before God. So God in the Old Testament speaks to Habakkuk. And this same thing is echoed in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul himself. When in Romans 1.17 he says, for, the gospel, a righteous, uh, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed. He says, you know the way to live right and, and what is righteousness is revealed in the, in the gospels. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Okay, So to live life with no regrets is to live a life of faith. To live a life trusting God, implicitly trusting God, trusting His Word, and saying, listen, if God's Word says this, then I'm going to apply this Word to my life. See, there are many people who listen to the Word of God, but then they go back and they don't apply the Word of God because they trust in other ways and other things to live by. They trust in, in their knowledge sometimes. They, they trust in what other people are saying. They trust in their degrees and, and whatever they have learned in their schools and universities. They trust in, in what's happening around them. They trust in their bank account balances. But the just or the people who live right at the end and who'll end up with no regrets in life are those who have lived their life by faith in Jesus Christ. Those are the ones who will live right. So to live life with no regrets is to live a life of faith. It is to trust God's plan for your life. It's tr to trust God's way. It's to trust God's purposes and to trust God in everything for your life. So coming back to Acts 20, verse 70 to 21, it says from Mil Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus, for the elders of the church, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility, with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul says, things were very difficult for me. But I didn't swerve or sway from my path because I was trusting God. I lived my life trusting in the purposes of God and doing what God has called me to do. Friends, as you see all kinds of things happening around us, and we do not know what the future holds for us. We do not know how things can turn out. Yes, they can turn out for better. But when you read the Bible and, and the book of Revelations, we find that things are, you know, things are getting pretty bad. So what do you do? The just shall live by faith. That's pretty much it. You live by faith. You trust God right now. For some of you who are so worried today and so much of concern and anxiety and worry in your hearts, listen to me. The just shall live by faith. Okay? So you can take that to the bank because you know what? When you trust God, He will come through for you. Well, how does Paul live his life right? Okay, in this passage of Scripture we read, the first thing we learn is he lived a life that is open. Okay, so how do you live right? Live a life that is in the open. Acts 20, 17, we read that before. He says, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. Paul says, he calls upon the elders and says, you know how I lived. I didn't live two different lifestyles. I didn't live one before you and one in hiding. You know everything about me. My life was lived in such a way, it was transparent before you. Paul was able to parade his life before uh, the people and said, you know, you judge how I lived before you. You know, to live right is to live such a, a life, a life that is transparent. A life that people can look at you and say, you know what, he's a man or a person of integrity because what he speaks is what he lives. 
and he lives right. You know, I hear so many people say, I don't care what people think. You know, I care what God thinks. You know, I don't care what people think. Now, the problem is that statement could be made, but sometimes it's only partially correct because as long as you're doing what is right and people want you to do what is wrong, then that statement applies. I don't care what people think. I only care what God thinks. If you are doing what is right and the people want you to do what is wrong, okay, then that applies. But we also need to realize that if you are doing what is wrong, that does not apply. We need to live our lives, and the way we live our lives affects people, and that is important. Paul lived blameless, a blameless life before God and man. We, we uh, read in the Bible how Joseph lived. He lived his life in such a way that he had favor with God, and because of that, he had favor with man. In other words, he lived a life that was so blameless, that was so, so good and so right that you know, people began to show him favor. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 5.16. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. He says, let your light shine before men. Where does he want your light to shine? Not in some hidden place, it's just before God in my, in, my, the, in my prayer closet and I'm sitting there and saying, Lord, let my life shine here. No, he says, let your light shine before men. And this is how Paul is living. He's letting his life shine before people and people could see his life. He says, you know how I lived. 1 Peter 2.12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you for doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day He visits us. In other words, even people who don't like you or your enemies, you live in such a way that they may persecute you, they may do bad things for, against you, but there will come a day in the day of their visitation, it says, in the day that God will visit them, there comes a day that their lives will be impacted by what you did. And friends, when you look at church history, especially the early church that was under such severe persecution, that's how the early disciples lived. They lived their lives before men. They, they were not perfect, obviously. And you know something about the Bible. It's so transparent. It talks about the good and the bad of everyone. It talks about their weaknesses. It talks about their strengths. Very transparent. But we know they lived in such a way that over time, that those who opposed them, the empire of Rome that opposed Christianity, ultimately became a Christian state or nation. This is living right. This is living such good lives in, the, in front of people, before people, that they will see your good works and bring glory to, uh, to God in heaven. In other words, live an examined life, a blameless life. The second thing about living life is to live a life of service. Paul says in verse 19, I served, to Acts 20 verse 19, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plot of the Jews. He said, I served God. Right living is a life of service. Remember, you have been called not to fulfill your own selfish purposes, but you have been called to fulfill the purposes of God and fulfill the destiny of God for your life. And that purpose is to serve God and to serve mankind. See, many people who end up with regret in their lives are those who serve their own purposes and their own selfish ways. These are the people who will end up one day thinking, I should have done more to serve people. 
I think it's uh, Bob Buford in his book Half um, Half Time talks about a life of significance versus a life of success. A life of success is a person who uses all his gifts, his talents, his abilities to uh, to enhance himself and serve his purposes. But a life of significance is a life where a person would use his talents, his gifts, his abilities to serve and bless and to enhance the life of others. That life is significant. This might have earthly success, but this has significance. And the work of this life, the one lived to elevate people, is a life that will echo in eternity. When you look at the life of Paul, he's totally immersed in serving people. That's how he lived. So when Paul was preaching, he was serving people. When Paul was traveling, it was to serve people. When Paul was mending tents, the goal was to serve people. He did it all to serve people. People. And that's why at the end he says, I have fought the good fight, I have run the race, I have finished, and I'm waiting for the prize. He could say that with such confidence, no regrets, because that's the way he lived. I remember when I was working at uh, Lanka Hospitals, it was called Apollo back then. I remember there were days that I would get so caught up in my work or so caught up in my own life that I would be thinking about my paycheck, I would be thinking about my position and promotions and stuff like that. And, and one day I was like that, you know, when I was walking down the corridors uh, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Ramesh, why did I bring you here? Because I remember the way I got the job was I was not interested in working uh, at Lanka Hospitals. I was, in fact, uh, the time I got the job at Lanka Hospitals, I had quit medicine and I'm one year I was, uh, you know, serving as a pastor in Kandy. This was when I was in Kandy. And uh, I was serving. I was in Bible school at the time. And um, I was in the church and serving in the church. And at that time, um, I got a call to say, there's this job opportunity. Why don't you come? And I spoke to my wife, uh, and Nirosha, and I said, listen, I don't want to do this. But she said, why don't you just try? Why don't you just go for the interview? Oh, they've got the interview. Well-meaning people, I remember my mother calling me and telling me, you know, I got this interview, why don't you even try? And I was like, no, I don't want this. But we were coming down to Colombo from Candy, and I thought, okay, let's, let's just go for the interview. Nothing lost. So I went. And I was really not interested. I sit in there outside waiting for my turn to be called in. And um, there was a computer screen. And on that computer screen, there was this, you know, you get this... Um, when the computers are kind of at rest, you get these things that go across it. I don't know what you call them. And there was this verse, not a verse, it was a statement, which basically said, God has a plan for you. And the moment I saw that, it was almost like some, you know, God spoke directly to my heart and I realized, oh no, I'm getting the job. I was in there, interview 15 minutes. 15 minutes, I was out with the job. And I knew I'd got the job. And I realized this is where God wanted me to be. And I came into the job wanting to serve God. But after a while, I got caught up in the things that were happening and all the, you know, what people were saying and, you know, people jockeying for power and position and, and salaries and, you know, all the good things that you can have. And I, was, I got caught up in that. And I was walking from my, my room to the, the emergency uh, uh, ward. And I was walking down that. I never forget the Lord speak to my heart and said, why did I keep you here? Why did I bring you here? And I realized the purpose I was there was to serve, not myself, but to serve God and the people he puts in my path. Friends, never forget, a life without regret is one that serves God and people. If you live selfishly, if you live to serve your own purposes, you will end up one day full of regret. Another way to live right is a life encouraging and helping others. Acts 20.20 20 says, You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. 
we serve God and others by helping, encouraging people. We live in a world that brings so much discouragement, so much negativity into the lives of people. It's sad. You know, we need people to be encouraging. Some people think that there's a ministry of discouragement. They go around discouraging people. They say the worst things to people. They always, you know, bring people down or they don't have a nice word to say about people. And sometimes that could be part of even our culture. Our culture is about, you know, laughing at people, cutting people, bringing down people sometimes. And the thing is that is wrong. We need to be a people who encourage others. We must remember we are not here to serve ourselves, but to serve others. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 20, 26 to 28, Not so with you, he says. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, as I said, the key to live a life of no regrets is a life where you encourage and lift people up. When you live such a life, you will have no regrets. And the fourth way to live right is proclaiming the truth. Acts 20.21 20, says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul lived his life telling people the truth, the truth of the gospel. He said what needed to be said. If someone needed to be corrected, he corrected them. If someone needed to be encouraged, he encouraged them. But nevertheless, he spoke the truth, and he spoke it in love. And one thing we learn about Paul is that he preached the whole counsel of God. He didn't just preach what people like to hear. Neither did he preach just for his own purposes. He preached the whole counsel of God. He preached the, you know, what some preachers call the underbelly of the gospel, the difficult things. He preached the good things. He preached the easy things. He preached the hard things. He preached it all. You know, one of the things that people live to regret is not having said the things that you should have said in this life. There are a lot of people who regret not saying those things. You know, one thing that you will regret is not telling the people you love that you do love them. You know, sometimes as men, you, would, you feel, I'm not going to tell this to my children. It sounds very soppy. I don't want to say these things. You know, you love them in your heart, but you don't want to tell them that. That's nonsense. Encourage your, your children. Encourage people. Affirm them. You know, one of the things that, you know, I never heard from my own father was affirmation. He never affirmed me. He never said, you know what, I'm proud of you. And therefore, I decided in my life, I'm going to tell that to my boys. I want my children to know right from the start that I'm not proud of them because they did great things or they whatever. I'm proud of them for who they are. Affirming them. Say the things that you need to say in this life and not regret once it's over. Well, the greatest thing that you and I need to tell people is to tell them the gospel. You know, I regret the times that there were people God brought into my life that I should have shared the word and the, the, the truth with. But because of my own fears, I didn't. And some of those people are no more. And I regret that. I, those are things I regret. And can you, imagine coming to the, can you imagine coming to the end of your life and realizing there are so many people that you should have shared the truth with which you did not share? Well, Paul comes to the end of his life and he knows he has done everything and said everything he has to say. He has no regrets. Well, that's how you live right. The second thing you do is love right. Acts 20, 22 to uh, 24 says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, 
I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus had given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Let me ask you, what do you love? What do you value in life? Paul is saying he did not love his own life, but considered it nothing for the sake of the gospel. In other words, he loved God and the purposes of God and serving God more than his own life. Jesus said, if you don't love, if you um, don't hate your mother, father, brother, sister, even your own life, you're not worthy of me. In other words, what you're saying is if your love for everything else is more than me, you're not worthy of me. You can't be my disciple. But he says, even if you love your own life more than him, you're not worthy of him. Paul is saying, I did not even love my own life. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John is saying very clearly, there are two things, friends. You have the world and you have God. There is no middle path. You've got to choose what you love. Those who love the world and the things of the world are going to wake up one day with lots of regret. But those who loved God more than life itself will wake up one day with no regrets. So Paul is saying, uh, John is saying, don't love the world. So many people today, even Christians, are living their life for the things of this world. They're pursuing the things of this world. They're pursuing the accolades of this world. They're pursuing the materialism of this world. They're pursuing, you know, uh, what people would say, the opinions of men, men of this world or people of this world. They're pursuing titles and positions of this world. Today, Facebook is filled with people trying to, to get likes and what people say of them. How many of those people who have thousands and thousands of likes have ever stopped to wonder, what does God think of me? What does God think of my life? Let me ask you a question. The one like you need, the one like I need is God's like. Does he like the way you're living? Does he like the way you're loving? That's important. You know, the wise King Solomon says, I did not deny myself anything. He went after everything that this world could give him. And back then, he had the resources to do that. He went after pleasure, wealth, prosperity, power, and he got it all. He was a powerful king. He was one of the greatest kings Israel ever had, the most powerful kings they had. He was one of the most prosperous men. You find people, even the queen of Sheba, the queen of Egypt, coming and looking at his prosperity and well, just and awed by what he had done. Right? He had everything, pleasure. I mean, he had women. He had wives and women and concubines like no man in the history of this world ever had. And yet, at the end of it all, he says, it's all meaningless, all vanity, all chasing after the wind. Here's a man who woke up one day and realized that all he pursued in life was in vain. And that's why Matthew 9, uh, 6, 19 to 21 says, Do not lay up yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will also be. So the question is, where is your heart? What do you love? What do you value the most? Because that is one day, my friends, you are going to wake up and realize, did I live a life with no regrets, or am I going to wake up one day with all kinds of regrets? Think about it. Here are some of the things you will never regret. You'll never regret spending quality time with your family. You can never regret that. You're going to wake up one day and only think, thank God I did that when I could. You know, one of the things COVID-19 did was enable people to spend time with their families. Now, how many of you actually took opportunity of that and spent quality time with your families? You will never regret spending quality time in prayer and reading the Bible and in the presence of God. Let me tell you, you will never regret that. You will never regret investing your life in people so that they will know 
the truth of the gospel. You will never regret leading people to God. You will never regret that. You will never regret even sharing the truth with people. You will never regret that. Anything that brings you or others closer to God and brings you and others into a place of carrying out the purposes of God, you will never regret. Those are things you will never regret. But let me tell you what you will regret. You will regret becoming a slave to material possessions. You will regret running after money. You will regret neglecting your relationship with God, your family, and the people God puts into your life. Those are things you will regret. Those things breed regret. Someone said it this way. He said, when this life is over, nobody's going to say, boy, I sure wish I spent less time with my family and more time at work. No one's going to say that. Nobody will say, I sure wish I prayed less and spent more time on pleasure and recreation. Why not? Because at the end of this life, friends, we will see the true value of things. What is of real value and what is not. All the deception will go down. And you and I will realize how important people and God and His purposes are. Remember, the only thing you take away from this world is your love for God and your love for people. You don't take away any of these material things around you. So if that is your only possession, how much are you taking with you? How much have you accumulated of the love you have for people and the love you have for God? How rich are you going to be? So, you know, there's a interesting, um, very interesting uh, song, a song that I like. My wife, of course, doesn't want me to play it because it actually talks about death in it. Uh, it's called, If Tomorrow Never Comes, Ronan Keaton. He says something, very, uh, he, the, the words of the song, I just want to read it because it, it's, it's very apt. He says this, if tomorrow never comes, will she know how much I loved her? Did I try in every way to show her every day that she is my only one? And if my time on earth were through, and she must face this world without me, is the love I gave her in the past going to be enough to last? And then he goes on to say, because I have lost loved ones uh, in my life who never knew how much I loved them. Now I live with the regret. And he ends by saying, so I made a promise to myself to say each day how much she means to me. And you know, there are times I play this song and I think, and it makes me think, have I loved my wife in a way that she knows? Have I loved my children in a way that they know how much I love them? Friends, one thing I know is this, that my father loved me but the problem was he never shared that with me. See, I know some of you men very specially, you love your family, you love your children, but I don't know why, you, we don't like to show it much. We will do things for them, give things to them, but we don't like to show it. Friends, don't wake up one day regretting, I should have done more to show them how much I love them. The question is, have I loved my wife in the way that Christ loved the church? Have I loved my children in such a way that they know Jesus because of the way I love them? Have I loved the people God has put in my life in that same way? To Paul, nothing else mattered. His whole life was lived to demonstrate the love of God and his love for God. And therefore, he, he, he has no regrets at the end of it all. 
The final thing is we need to think right. A clear conscience follows a life with no regret. Paul in Acts 20 verse 25 to 27 says, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So he knows his life is over. He knows this is the end. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Now Paul had a pretty bad past. He put many people in jail and probably executed many more. And now he's saying, I'm innocent of the blood of Jesus, uh, the blood of all men, he says. And you ask, why is he saying that? He's saying that because from the time he realized and came to the realization of what he was doing was wrong and he turned his life around, he made sure that what he did in the past of condemning people, he's going to channel into saving people. And therefore, he gave the gospel at every opportunity. And if you look at this man, it's amazing. He goes from one city to the next, being beaten, stoned, kicked out. And then he goes to the next city and he preaches the gospel. And they will beat him and they'll put him into prison. And then they will kick him out and say, don't come back. And he go to the next city. And after a couple of cities, you think you come to a place and say, you know what? I need a rest. I need a break from all these beatings. But he doesn't. He goes to the next city and he starts over again and over again and over again because he knows this. He knows he has one life to live and he's going to live it maximum. He's going to take maximum opportunity to make sure that every single person that crosses his path will know the truth of the gospel. In other words, he's saying, my conscience is clear. My conscience is clear before God and before man. Now, again, this does not mean he didn't make mistakes. He did make mistakes. But he didn't stay in the mistake. He didn't stay in that place to wallow in regret and misery. He got up out of there and channeled his entire effort to making sure that his conscience will be clear at the end of it all. He shared God's love more effectively, learning from the things he did in the past. See, a clear conscience is that inner freedom of spirit that comes from a place that you know that you're right with God and you're right with man. You know, in Acts 24, verse 16, he says, I, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and man. You know, I've been speaking about purity of heart, and purity of heart is to have a heart that is unhypocritical, a heart that is not divided, a heart that wills one thing, and that one thing is God. So a pure conscience is a conscience that is unhypocritical, undivided, so it knows what is right, and it applies that to, it, to the life. And ultimately, if you and I want to have a pure uh, uh, a conscience, a right conscience, we need to live like that. What is God telling me to do? I'm going to do it. I may make mistakes. I may fall and stumble on my way. I may not be perfect in how I do it. But my whole effort and my zeal and my passion is going to be channeled from living a selfish, purposeless life that is going to end with regret to live a life that is purposeful and channeled towards seeking the purposes of God, to be a blessing to people, and to make sure that at the end of my life, every single person that crossed my path experienced God's love through my life. And that life, friends, when you wake up on the other side of eternity, you will be able to say, as Paul said, I have run the race, I have fought the fight. And now I'm waiting for my prize because I have no regrets. Friends, I don't know what your past has been. I don't know where you have been before, what you have done before. I don't know. Okay? 
And maybe some of those things, you're looking back and think, I shouldn't have done it. There's a lot of regret there. And your life may be like Paul's before he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. But I'm telling you today, this is your time. This, is your, this message is for you. To say, listen, you don't have to live in the past. You don't have to live with regret. You can turn it around and use all that you did to, to indulge in the wrong things that bring regret to turn it around and channel it towards God and serving God and serving people. Loving God and loving people. Walking by faith. Walking in a way that you live with no regrets. Let us pray. Father, we come before your throne of grace, and Lord, we want to thank you. And Lord, your word is powerful and active like a two-edged sword. And today, I pray that this word will penetrate deep into our hearts. And Lord, bring conviction and bring change and transformation into our lives. Lord, let it bring encouragement. I pray at this time uh, of, of, of uh, all kinds of things happening around us, darkness. Now, we will live lives of no regret, lives that are right, lo lo loving right, living right. And, and thinking right, O oh God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.